Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, 5G in Business, Becoming Your Industry Leader. My name is Amanda. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Optus. Optus Business provides solutions that help Australian business owners stay resilient and connected and to empower their ambitious growth plans. Powered by digital everywhere technology, as well as a network of 27 Optus Business Centres and over 200 business zones in Optus retail stores across the country. They're on hand to help business owners leverage their technology to be more effective and productive and help run their businesses from anywhere at any time. Backed by Optus Mobile Fixed and Satellite Networks, regional strength and local expertise, Optus Business is committed to helping every Australian business succeed. Its business products and services include the Business Connect plan, connecting up to eight SIMs with price certainty and a choice of shared data packages and Optus Loop, a cloud-based service, allowing customer calls to be connected on any compatible device with no need for a physical landline. Many businesses rely on Optus to provide them with reliable network connections, the latest devices and industry-leading technology so that they can better serve their customers and always stay connected to their colleagues and trusted suppliers. Today we will hear from two speakers, followed by a live audience Q&A session, so I encourage you all to send questions through to our speakers by the YouTube chat box during today's presentations. I'd now like to welcome our moderator for this afternoon, Belinda Lofts. Belinda rejoined Optus in 2015 to lead the Optus Network Operations and Assurance team. Belinda is accountable for ensuring the availability of all fixed and mobile services carried over the Optus Network Australia-wide, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Prior to rejoining Optus, Belinda spent her career in various information technology leadership roles at Downer, West Farmers, IBM and Optus, of course. Belinda holds a Bachelor of Applied Science from the University of Technology, Sydney. Please welcome Belinda Lofts. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome again to our viewers. Thank you for joining us today for an exciting instalment of the Thought Leader series. My name is Belinda Lofts, and I will be hosting today's session. Today, Australian businesses are experiencing unprecedented change through digital disruption, and we believe this is for the better. The leading light of this disruption sits firmly with 5G, with unprecedented speeds that deliver significantly increased operational performance and superior user experience the transition to 5G is here and it will help society evolve as we live, work and play. 5G is limited only by our imagination and what we know today is merely scratching the surface of what we will learn tomorrow. We all have a role to play, not just the providers of telecommunication solutions. I'd like to welcome our first speaker for today, Harvey Wright, Head of 5G at Optus. Harvey will be introducing you to the future and the now of technology in the form of 5G. He'll be covering the fundamental differences between 4G and 5G, and then the diversity of potential applications that will start to demonstrate why we here at Optus are so excited about what the future holds as 5G accelerates into the everyday. Please join me in welcoming Harvey Wright. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Harvey Wright. I'm head of uh, 5G at Optus. And over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd like to give you a bit of an update around uh, 5G, the technology, and the opportunity uh, that it will unlock. So I'm conscious that you know most people will be aware of 5G, but I'd like to spend a little bit of time just uh, providing an overview of the technology itself, what it is, what it's not, and, and what are some of the key benefits. 
Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, 5G is the latest uh, evolution of mobile wireless uh, network technology. Um, obviously, in the 80s, we had the, the first generation of mobile connectivity. We had 2G, which is around digital voice. We had 3G, which was around wireless internet, 4G, and now 5G. Now, the generations are basically set by a, um, a range of standards uh, about what the uh, technology does, how it works. Um, and the three key pillars of 5G that have been designed into uh, the standards uh, fall into sort of three buckets. Basically, uh, you've got the benefits, which we describe as enhanced mobile broadband. That's basically providing uh, faster speeds uh, as the network capacity has expanded. And that's obviously what most people associate um, with 5G, which is enhanced speeds. Um, but associated with that, you've also got this notion of ultra reliable, uh, low latency connectivity. So enabling real time connections to take place over that network as well. And then finally, you've got massive machine type communication. So the ability to support many different connected devices uh, on the network. So orders of magnitude, uh, more devices than we currently have on, on uh, 4G. So that's a very quick uh, synopsis of what 5G is, uh, what some of the, the sort of the key benefits are. I think the, the key thing to remember about 5G is um, as a technology, it is being deployed at scale and at pace at the moment. If you look across the globe, um, you can see, uh, you know, majority of countries now have started on the, uh, uh, the 5G uh, pathway in terms of implementation. Uh, many carriers, many operators across the world are deploying 5G. And in fact, the, the rate at which 5G is being deployed is signif significantly higher uh, than that of, of 4G. You can see on the chart there in terms of the, the comparison between 4G and 5G rollout. So it is large, it's significant. Um, you know, we're expecting by the end of this year to have over half a billion uh, people uh, co connected to, to um, 5G. Um, and it's, from an industry perspective, a major transformative event. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. But perhaps before I talk about 5G, it's worthwhile talking a little bit about 4G and how that changed the game for us uh, uh, over the, the sort of the previous 10 years. Now, um, 4G is interesting because from an operator perspective, because uh, it provides a, a much um, effectively a fatter pipe in terms of connectivity. You, you, you're looking at being able to uh, deliver applications and experiences, in particular, things like streaming video, uh, for example. Um, and from a, an operator perspective, that in, in a nutshell was the killer use case, the sort of um, killer app, if you like, for, for uh, 4G connectivity. Um, you'd have had the, the launch of smartphones, you had uh, the iPhone out there, and consumers were hungry for um, uh, applications and, and, and use cases such as video streaming on those devices. So in many ways, uh, the rollout of 4G from an operator perspective was quite straightforward. It was about sort of um, uh, unlocking that, the potential of those use cases opening the taps as it were and, and letting customers consume data on the smartphone device um, and as customers uh, used more they they basically consumed more they upgraded uh, their 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 phones they upgraded their their plans and and you know, purchased more more data and so from a an operator's perspective the the um the use case and and um uh, business model was, was, was quite straightforward. It was about giving more of what customers were already doing in terms of, of 4G. Fast forward to, to, to 5G, and in fact, you've got a little bit of that as well. So obviously customers today are upgrading as we speak to, to 5G handsets. Those handsets are designed to work on the 5G network. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, consumers today are getting um, a great a faster experience on those handsets as a result of, of five uh, as a result of 5g so that um, is not the end of the story though because what um we've got with with 5g is a range of different capabilities that we don't have in addition to, to speed uh, the most obvious is the the idea of ubiquitous low latency connectivity and coupled with technologies such as edge compute, for example, or artificial intelligence, 
all of a sudden you've got a much richer ecosystem of um, uh, of, of applications and, 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 and use cases. And in fact, if I go to the next slide, and there's a lot on this slide, and apologies, the, the, the text is a little bit small to see, but effectively you've got a range of different uh, vertical applications, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, each containing um, individual use cases. So taking one as an example on, on here, we've got you know, video experience. And video experience is really interesting from a 5G perspective because um, in addition to being able to stream large files uh, to customers on the go, um, there is an ability to also do a lot of graphics processing in the cloud. So today, if you want to run something like a, um, uh, you know, a VR experience or, or do something like gaming, uh, you've got to have a very powerful console, a very powerful computer, uh, potentially a, you know, a very powerful um, smartphone device. And that comes with the, the need for uh, additional battery and, and cooling and, and so on. With 5G, because you're able to do a lot of that processing in the cloud, it takes a lot of the um, pressure off that end user device. And all of a sudden, being able to render images in the cloud and stream them to a relatively um, you know, dumb or thin device uh, becomes uh, possible. So within video experience, all of a sudden, you can start to talk about things like um, 360 degree uh, live sports broadcasts, for example. You can start to have things like um, immersive shopping experiences where you can use uh, AR or, or VR to sort of view the, 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 the product itself. Um, you can have uh, you know, video conferencing like this, but done at a, at a, um, a more immersive level where you know, I would be in, in, in 3D and, and we'd be in a, in a virtual room. So all of a sudden, you know, being able to have that layer of connectivity, that, that low latency connectivity coupled with the power of cloud compute opens up a range of, of different use cases. Um, and the ones that, you know, from, a, from an Optus perspective, we're really interested in are things like um, reinventing core connectivity. And you'll have seen some of the uh, products that we've launched, such as the uh, you know, wireless um, broadband um, products. So, so being able to uh, provide an alternative to uh, NBN connection through to embedded type um, uh, connectivity in, in specific devices, such as say consoles or, or TV. Gaming is a big application for um, for 5G because again you've got that low latency connectivity so being able to game on the go uh, cloud gaming which is a really interesting uh, use case really interesting sort of technology very much unlocked by 5G consumer IoT as I mentioned uh, at the beginning the, the, the idea of 5G is it supports a much um, greater density of connected devices so all of a sudden being able to connect sensors and wearables on the go becomes um, um, a great opportunity video i've already spoken about so those from a consumer perspective are the territories that we're really interested in from a an enterprise perspective again ar vr becomes an interesting use case but in this in this situation it's about providing remote support or remote uh, training for, for for workers um or remote monitoring of 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 uh, services you've got connected vehicles so again once you've uh, got the ability to um, provide that that um, large uh, you know fat pipe in terms of connecting things like cars or um, uh, you know drones for example the, the ability to stream entertainment uh, down and 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 be able to uh, stream information up becomes a lot um, a lot more possible and again coupled with the ability to sort of process information in the cloud makes things like um, autonomous driving or, um, you know, uh, platooning of trucks, a, a, a use case that becomes uh, possible. Manufacturing has a range of different use cases available. Uh, and, you know, much of, of what 5G is, is being applied to is, is the sort of industry 4.0 revolution that you're probably aware of as well. Um, drones, again, another form of, of connected vehicle and a range of different industry solutions ranging from utilities through to, to, to healthcare. So I suppose the key takeaway here is the fact that rather than one uh, single use case focused on a, a single type of, of application in, in the form of a, of a smartphone, 
with 5G, you've got a much broader frontier, a much greater diversity of potential use cases that, that um, it opens up. Now, that is a great opportunity, but it's also um, a bit of a challenge because from an operator perspective, uh, being able to pick winners and, and place bets becomes a, a little bit more uh, complex. So if I think about, you know, from an Optus perspective, how we are approaching the, the opportunity that is 5G and how we are going to drive a level of monetization. Because remember, at the end of the day, 5G is a major investment for a, for a company like uh, Optus. There are sort of three core pillars that we are uh, focusing on. The first is around innovation. We have yet to, to um, uncover or, or identify the killer app. Um, and therefore, there's a, a great opportunity for organizations like us and our partners to get out there and to innovate in a, in a customer-centric and, and, and purpose-driven way to uh, identify those and unlock those and co-create those. So 5G, I've seen described um, uh, by many commentators as a, as a platform for innovation, this sort of testbed, this sort of foundation on which we can start to develop really exciting, really innovating services. Um, the second key pillar is, is one of, of focus um, with a, a wide range of opportunities and, and many you know, horses to back, as it were. It's really important that we um, zero in on, on those areas that, that we can add the most value to, um, you know, identifying where we've got key strengths, where we can you know, deliver that level of um, uh, sustained differentiation uh, to create long term value for um, our shareholders and our, and, our, and our customers. And then the final one is around partnership. Now, as you probably gathered from that chart before, uh, I showed before, um, you know, many of those applications, whether it's in healthcare or utility or manufacturing or, or, or mining, um, are, are things that we're going to have to work very closely with um, our customers, our enterprise customers to uh, develop. So, you know, we're looking to uh, establish a um, an ongoing level of um, co-creation with a, a range of, of of partners and customers um, within within industry. So we have in, in place a range of um, uh, initiatives around engaging with enterprise customers. Um, the government is also involved in terms of um, uh, participating as a, as, a, as a funder, as a partner of of five G innovation as well. I think a great example of this was you know, some of the recent uh, government grants that have been uh, established around some innovation projects that, that we've partnered with. Um, example of one of those is, is the uh, partnership we've done with um, uh, Amazon and, and, and Endeavor Energy for the application of 5G for drones and, and the monitoring of uh, an electricity grid. So, you know, uh, rather than lots of folks climbing up poles and, and inspecting pylons, you do it remotely, you do it using um, uh, streamed uh, video and telemetry of, of the power grid itself. So again, a great example of, of various partners coming together, each with a variety of different strengths to define uh, an opportunity. Um, and, and I think in, in, in that case, you know, it doesn't take much to imagine a situation where rather than drones inspecting a, a electricity utility, you have uh, you know, a water utility or um, a local government agency or a mining company. So again, once you've unlocked the the, the use case, the, the potential for application in other areas uh, can soon surface as well. So anyway, that's uh, hopefully um, a, a useful um, uh, overview of, of 5G and, and its applications. And I'll look forward to um, answering any questions later on in the session. Thanks. Thank you, Harvey, for your insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, John Caney, who leads business development at Amazon Web Services in Australia and New Zealand. John will bring to life some use cases where 5G is a fundamental component of success. Cloud computing, drones, and other production systems. John will demonstrate practical applications of 5G in business today, and perhaps even the future. Please join me in welcoming John. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's John Caney, and I head up business development for AWS across Australia and New Zealand. I'm based in Melbourne. Over the next 15 minutes, there's three things I wanted to cover with you. Firstly, for those of you who may not be familiar with who Amazon Web Services is, 
introduce who we are and what we do. Secondly, tell you some stories, tell you some stories about how our customers are using cloud computing in situations that I think will benefit significantly as 5G becomes more a part of our lives and, and our work. And thirdly, perhaps most importantly, really pique your curiosity, get you thinking about some of the opportunities to use 5G in your businesses and organizations going forward. So just by way of introduction, Amazon Web Services is a wholly owned subsidiary of amazon.com and actually started life as an internal project. We um, developed a series of IT services for ourselves in the early 2000s. And in 2006, we made some of these services available to external customers. We now operate a very broad and deep uh, set of cloud services that covers things like compute, storage, databases, networking, and many other areas. We make these available to customers on an as needed basis. We operate in Australia uh, through our team, but also one of our 25 geographic regions is here in Australia as well, which means that we have a set of data centers providing our core cloud computing services to customers. When AWS thinks about 5G and the opportunity it represents for our customers, we think in terms of the edge. What is the edge? The edge is about moving infrastructure and software um, closer to the end user to allow the data processing and analysis that would otherwise be done in the cloud um, to be done closer to that end user. But why, why would we do that? Well, there's lots of examples where new user experiences and new capabilities um, are made possible through some really innovative uh, devices and, capability and, and hardware capabilities, but they require um, that processing to be done close to the end user with both in a fast way, but also in a reliable, secure and cost-effective way. So for us, when our customers have use cases where they're generating data in a decentralized way, so out, out in the real world in many different places, as opposed to perhaps in a single da uh, data center, where the volume of that data is significant, um, and also the computation that needs to be done on that data is, is really high. These are edge use cases. Or these are the things we think about as edge use cases in our business. To help customers with this, we have a proven edge to cloud model that we use. I'm not gonna take you through all of this today, but uh, to make you aware of the way we think about it, I'm working through this from left to right. The AWS cloud is those um, set of IT services that we deliver out of our um, global regions and our global, uh, our global data centers. And then the edge is how those services move onto either the customer's premises or into a partner uh, ecosystem, for example, becoming part of the 5G mobile network. And there's both hardware and software solutions that, that are involved in that. And uh, I won't take you through the details, but there's some, some of the examples of those um, there. Now let's talk about some customers. I've got four examples um, to give you, and I'm not going to do, be able to do justice to any of these in, in a short presentation like this. So I'd certainly encourage you to do your own research on these companies and, and uh, examples. Um, there's plenty of um, further information available out there on the internet on all of these. The first I wanted to talk about is a homegrown example. Um, the company is called BigMate. They're a Brisbane-based technology company. And BigMate are specialists in IoT, telematics, and machine vision. And in particular, their focus is around workplace safety. They have a product called Warney. And Warney um, is very uh, innovative in the way that it ingests video streams, typically coming from a customer's CCTV network, and uh, uses machine vision to do some really, really interesting things. First of all, it detects the various um, objects uh, within that footage, whether that's people, machines, equipment, and allows the customers to do a whole lot of interesting things with that information. In particular, establish some thresholds. For example, um, there are many workplace safety um, requirements now to uh, uh, provide a certain proximity around different types of equipment. What Warney allows customers to do is to configure the solution so that if, for example, someone comes within five meters of a particular type of equipment, the machine vision automatically detects this um, and can send an, it, an alert in near real time um, to the user, to the machine operator, and, and to other stakeholders as well. 
So what does 5G represent in terms of the opportunity for a product like Warney? Well, first of all, um, CCTV is to a large extent either hardwired or uh, reliant upon internal Wi-Fi networks. So 5G represents a huge opportunity for these solutions to become far more mobile, to become far higher resolution in terms of the quality of the imagery that's being done. But also as 5G also includes um, the opportunity to compute and to perform an analytics close to that edge um, to deploy more of that either um, on-site or near site uh, through the 5G network itself. And for me, Warney is a great example of, I think, what we should expect to see more broadly within, within our world kind of going forward, whether that's in kind of high traffic situations like train stations or, or airports, um, but also perhaps in other you know, work environments as well. Second example I wanted to talk about was drones. Um, Drone technology has just come so far in the last 10 years, but often we think about drones in terms of a great way to take a fantastic holiday video. We don't think of drones as an edge device and an edge device that can be used in, um, in, in a work environment. This picture is something I think you'll start to see more and more of in, in the years going forward, uh, of engineers using drones day to day as part of a construction project. The modern drone has the opportunity to not only capture visual information, but also multi-spectral information, so UV and infrared uh, information to detect things like temperature changes, moisture levels, et cetera. And also increasingly um, capabilities like LIDAR, uh, which is a, a, a form of radar technology to provide extremely accurate um, distance measurement. So the device itself has evolved significantly. Um, and a company like Drone Deploy provides a framework that um, uh, takes the drone uh, device and actually turns it into a very, very powerful mapping tool. Um, drone deploy uh, um, allow users to create both 2D and 3D models of both interior and exterior um, um, situations. Uh, and I'll let you have a look at uh, some examples of that maybe on the, on the drone deploy website. Um, for those in the construction industry, the ability to actually do both an internal and an external flyby of a construction site and capture very, very accurate um, information allows you to do not only ser site surveys, but things like monitor construction progress, do site safety reviews, and many, many other um, things as well. So thinking of the drone as a really powerful edge device and thinking about the applicability of 5G, once again, um, increased connectivity of, of the drone, uh, much, much more uh, opportunity for higher resolution information, as I say, not just visual, but many other types of information that the drone can collect, and the opportunity to perform more of that computation either on the drone itself or near the drone through the 5G network. And it's not just drones that are getting the technology. Realware is a great example of where wearables are headed. Now this, uh, this device, uh, is, is, as the hard hat would indicate, is industrial grade. More importantly, it's equipped with cameras, microphones, headphones, and a heads up visual display that you can see over, um, over the wearer's um, right eye there. These types of wearables are gonna open up a huge uh, opportunity to rethink the way we, we do work. Whether it's the service technician that's able to access, you know, technical schematics, service history, service information in a hands-free way um, to allow them to address their, their field requirement. That's one set of use cases. The other one that's really interesting, particularly in the time of COVID, is, is a remote inspection capability. So think of someone on site, um, maybe it is a service technician that's working on site, um, but this, uh, this type of wearable also allows someone remotely to connect into that either to observe what that, uh, in the, this example, a service technician is actually seeing and doing, but also potentially to direct that person um, to look for particular things or, um, you know, try certain things. And this is applicable when it comes to uh, auditing requirements, um, workplace safety reviews, et cetera, et cetera. This is still in its infancy, but 5G makes these types of applications far more reliable, far more, um, far higher quality, 
And you should expect to see this type of thing uh, also going forward. Last but not least, a little bit of fun, but also um, I think a really powerful example is Shot Tracker. Uh, Shot Tracker have developed a, a really interesting platform for basketball. Um, they use a sensor-based technology to track not only all the players on a basketball court, but the ball, or in the case of basketball training, all of the balls are on the basketball court. And using this information, which is captured in a, a huge amount of detail, it allows them to generate the statistics and the analytics that are both useful for coaches, for players, but also for broadcasters and fans. And um, and using and this actually has been built using 5G technology. Um, I think it was originally built with 4G technology, and you can see the difference that or the uh, additional quality that Shot Track has been able to add by using 5G technology. If you um, just have a look on their uh, website. But they are using a combination of um, analytics within the 5G network, but also um, taking that data back to AWS to, um, to do additional analysis and, and as I say, uh, integrating with uh, broadcasters, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bit of fun, but it also points the way to the future in terms of the opportunity to use this kind of sensor technology in many other industries and many other settings. So for example, if it wasn't basketball players and basketballs we were tracking, but maybe equipment and um, materials moving around a work site or moving through an organization or moving through a supply chain, um, not only um, knowing wh where things are from time to time, but actually being able to track things in real time. Um, I think this, uh, this type of technology really shows the, the way of the future. So hopefully those examples have piqued your curiosity and stimulated your thinking. Um, as I say, lots of information out there on all of these examples, but if, uh, if there's something we can do to assist you with uh, any, of, any of the things we've talked about, look forward to that and uh, looking forward to the Q&A session. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. What a great set of use cases. I am gonna take the opportunity now to ask a few questions of our panelists. And my first question is for Harvey. Um, Harvey, you referenced the federal government's 5G innovation grant, and you shared a, a really good example of drones monitoring electricity grids. It brought to life how one use case could inspire many others. Can you share a few more examples like the application in utility and mining that you spoke about? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Belinda. I, I think you know the the example um, that I provided there was 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 useful because, it, like you say, it did uh, illustrate how one single application, uh, once developed and once solved, could potentially be applied to to multiple different uh, industry verticals. But I think it's also interesting because for me, it demonstrates the the combination of technologies that you're likely to see in terms of some of these five G use cases. 5G at the end of the day is, a, is, a, is an enabler and you know, customers are not going to necessarily uh, buy 5G per se. They're going to be buying the, the, the services that it, it unlocks and, and, and enables. Now, in the case of that um, drone example, you've got a number of things going on. You've got the, the connectivity, so the, um, the high bandwidth, low latency connectivity that, that 5G provides. Um, that allows someone to control the drone, for example, in real time. But at the same time, you've got the ability to um, uh, stream a lot of uh, information back into the cloud, as John was sort of talking about, um, to process it. So, for example, it doesn't require someone to be able to work out whether a pylon is broken or, or not. You can use um, visual recognition and artificial intelligence to work that out for you if you have a, a, a computer powerful enough. And the great thing about 5G is that because of the low latency, because of the high bandwidth, all of that processing can be done uh, in the cloud. So you've effectively got the, the power of a supercomputer in, in, in terms of that, that small device, that end user device, that drone that was actually um, out there and in, in, in doing the inspection. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned the idea of a, of a local council. So again, if, if you're any sort of organization that has uh, assets that needed to be, need to be monitored or tracked um, or inspected, uh, and, and you know the a wide variety of different industry use cases there. 
um, then that particular use case has has definite application. Um, you know, mining similarly as well. You've you've got the situation where you have um, lots of lots of uh, infrastructure, um, um, you know, significant levels of of um, uh, risk, and therefore the need to sort of manage and and and, and monitor that. So uh, it's another great example where any sort of remote monitoring and and uh, use of um, cloud based uh, AI to to um, understand the situation is is is, is quite great. So. Um, wide wide range of use cases uh, across many different industries. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Harvey. Um, applications do appear to be endless. Uh, John, um, just a quick question for you. Uh, I understand AWS are also involved in the five G innovation uh, innovation initiative. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So maybe just picking up on. Um and what Harvey's been saying about the work with Endeavor Energy. So um, Optus and AWS obviously working together with um, with an AWS specialist partner called Unleash Live. They're a um, Sydney-based uh, company with offices also in the US. Um, and they really bring that expertise around machine vision uh, and getting the data back into the cloud and doing the analytics that Harvey was uh, talking about. Um, and in terms of the AWS services back on the cloud, there's a few few of our services that are key to that uh, particular example. One is a service called Kinesis, which is a high bandwidth data streaming service that allows you to get the data from a device like a drone back, um, back to the cloud. Um, and then Unleash Live are also using our storage service, which we call S3, as well as our Elastic Compute service to do that um, high computational work uh, back in the cloud. So. Um, yeah, so it's a really, really great local example of us uh, working together around a, a 5G use case. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and John, while I'm with you, I was particularly taken by the wearables use case uh, from real, realware.com. Um, it's a good example where wearables that traditionally may have been seen as a consumer solution are very much applicable in the enterprise space as well. Yeah, I think this for me this is really exciting because it's um, we're really only limited by our imagination in terms of how we use it. But um, in terms of the actual devices, they they you know as we all know in our in our consumer world, you know, th these um, devices have have come so far in just the last few years. So whether you're talking about you know I would say a high end wearable like the Realware um, example I gave, or you know, whether it's a watch or a fitness tracker or a, um, a glasses. Well, there are even rings now for um, you know that that are fitted with sensors. The um, the, the range of devices is is really um, ex ex has expanded significantly and continues to expand. And that's before you even get into specialist devices, whether that's you know medical monitoring devices, etc. So um, two things: one is you know th there's a huge range of options in uh, today and going forward. Secondly, many of the devices which you would otherwise think of as a consumer device um, can be repurposed for enterprise use cases. So, um, and we've talked a lot about drones, but a lot of the drones in use today in enterprise use cases, they're commercial drones. They're, they're drones that you would go and buy from a, a regular a retail store um, and use, uh, use solutions like Drone Deploy I mentioned um, as, as a way of actually turning it into an enterprise um, an enterprise device, if you like. So um, lots going on in that space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and while we're on the topic of wearables, Harvey, you spoke of a world where 5G becomes a key element to keeping connected the multiple wearable devices that consumers are using. So are we seeing a dramatic rise in these wearables at Optus? Oh, we're definitely seeing uh, an uptick, and, and you know, folks would be aware of of some of the mass market um, uh, devices that are out there. I mean, John mentioned uh, watches. You, you, you've got the you know, trackers and sensors. Um, there's, a, there's a range of of things that are going to connect, and, and as I mentioned, part of the the five G standards um, is that it can create, it can support a much greater density of of connected devices. Um, you know, four G in a way wasn't really Designed to to do the sort of uh, high density multi um, device uh, connectivity that that you know we're, we're now starting to see, whereas five G has that you know baked into the standards. Uh, in terms of of uptake, though, um, you know we expect that to be something that will lift pretty significantly over the coming years. 
Um, you're already starting to see uh, a number of the major tech players make uh, movements in the space. Uh, in, the, in the case of, of um, you know, headsets for, for AR or VR applications, you've, you've got the likes of you know, Facebook uh, with their Oculus uh, device or, or, or you know, Microsoft with, 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 with HoloLens. There's a, there's a range of, of devices that we believe will, will make their way into the um, uh, consumer space. Um, and I think you know, it's interesting because you know, a few of us will be familiar with the whole you know, Google Glasses uh, concept that didn't quite uh, take off. I think in some ways it was perhaps a little bit uh, ahead of its time in the sense that the, the, the technology wasn't there to support it. Um, but now when you've got the uh, ability to um, do a lot of the graphics rendering and, and computation in the cloud, you don't need um, the, 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 the high levels of, of, of computation required to make something like uh, an augmented reality uh, set of glasses work. Um, and that, that, that's important because all of a sudden, you know, you're no, no longer needing to have batteries, um, you know, somehow designed into a, into a, a glass that they're, they're going to be, um, lighter. They're going to be, um, um, easier to, 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 to wear, more discreet, I suppose. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're opening up some really interesting, uh, use cases around, uh, augmented, uh, reality overlays to, People's environments, you know, so the ability to to have uh, everyday objects or places uh, tagged in such a way that they have you know, rich information, for example, or the ability to watch a um, uh, a sporting event, uh, for example, with information overlaid in real time uh, becomes uh, possible as well. So, as John said, it's you know only limited by imagination in terms of the the different types of of ways in which that technology can be applied. Yeah, love that. And when you mention sporting events, then um, it probably leads into my next question. John spoke around Shot Tracker, and we know that Optus has won the uh, broadcasting rights to the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023. And given the rate of adoption that you've described with 5G, can you share some insights to maybe how 5G technology will feature, you know, in that event? Yeah, well, I can't, I can't, um, I can't uh, reveal too many of our secrets in terms of what we're planning. But, but I, I would maybe talk in, in more general terms around the the application of five uh, G technologies to something like um, a stadium event, right? So, if you if you think about it, there's there's a number of ways in which we can really transform the entertainment experience that is going to a, a, a football match, for example. Um, you know, some of that is around allowing um, uh, customers to experience that um, remotely. So um, you, you've got technologies, for example, like volumetric broadcast, which is being able to um, um, film the the, uh, the event itself with uh, hundreds of, of cameras from various angles that allows you to then place the viewer uh, in a virtual way anywhere in, in the stadium. So. If you want to, you know, stand behind the the the, the goal. If you want to stand, you know, pitch side or uh, in, in a box seat or whatever it is, you can do all of those virtually. So, in other words, with enough computational power, you can you can essentially render the 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 um, location for for the for the customer real time. So, you know, that's quite mind blowing when you think about it in terms of you know what that could do to a, a viewing experience. Um, you know, no longer is it a, a question of of watching it in a, on, on a screen, on you know, on a, on a couple of cameras filming the match, but actually you can uh, almost be there in terms of, of of the reality. So that's that's a sort of exciting technology that, that you know we're, we're looking at in terms of a stadium experience. And then the other one is actually for those that are in the stadium, um, you know, the ability to apply real time. Um, information and John, um, you know, mentioned that in terms of the example there, in terms of shot tracking and 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 the like. But you know, for any event, um, you know, the ability to to see stats or um, you know uh, some sort of overlay around the 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 the, the playing environment or players themselves uh, becomes possible. So that I'm what I'm watching is, is is different to my friend who's sitting next to me in in, in the stadium because we've got our own you know immersive and interactive. Uh, level of, of of content overlay, 
So, you know, the, the, the stadium experience is again, a great, a great one to, to delve into because it has you know, multiple facets, multiple ways in which we can take it and experience today um, and, and really transform it and enhance it for our customers. Yeah, sounds super exciting. So we'll now move to, into Q&A session where we bring you, our audience, into the discussion. And if you'd like to submit a question, please do so via the chat box. Um, we are overjoyed to have both Harvey and John with us today, and we want you to ask any of those burning questions that you may have. We did receive some questions on registration, and I'm going to kick off with some of those questions. So the first question comes from Lakshantha in Queensland. And the question is, when should we expect a complete rollout of 5G in Australia? And Harvey, I'm going to throw to you for that question. Yeah, so obviously all of the major operators now um, have launched 5G and, and there's a, um, obviously a, a race underway to, to, to roll out coverage. Yeah, my sense is that over the next couple of years, you're, you're going to see um, a sort of a, a level of coverage that will be you know, mass market in terms of uh, key uh, metropolitan areas and, and transport corridors with, with 5G enabled. But I'd probably just um, um, put one caveat on that, which is 5G itself is not necessarily one single technology. It's not just about whether you've got 5G or not. Um, 5G itself is based, or any wireless technologies itself, are based on um, different spectrum bands. and these bands provide uh, different uh, uh, conditions in terms of both range uh, of coverage as well as capacity. Um, and most recently um, uh, in Australia, there's been a, an auction around what we term as millimeter wave um, band uh, spectrum. So this is um, very short wave spectrum, super high capacity, super high speeds, but, but, but low in coverage in terms of um, ability to, to propagate from, from the tower. So in parallel to sort of rolling out the 5G using the existing spectrum bands that we have today, we're also in the process of adding an extra layer to the, to the 5G through things like millimeter wave. Now, what that will mean is that you have various sort of areas, various sort of pockets of um, uh, uh, capacity and connectivity that, that, that differ from, from, from other areas. So the notion that there will be this sort of um, uh, sort of coast to coast seamless connectivity for, for for 5G is probably not the right sort of um, model to sort of think about it. Is you're going to have areas of 5G deployment that are suited to specific um, customer needs. In the case of millimeter wave, uh, it could be that you know when you've got um, uh, industry applications that require it. So um, uh, you know particular use cases that have the, the, the need for high capacity, uh, low latency, you know, gigabit uh, speeds, you would deploy millimeter wave in, in those areas. So for example, in industrial parks, in stadiums, as, as I mentioned before, um, in sort of uh, transport hubs, we have a lot of, of, of people congregating or, or, or commuting through, um, or indeed in, in, in terms of individual factories. So one of the interesting concepts we've got with 5G is this notion of private networks. So being able to work with a, a, a business to deploy 5G specifically for that customer. Um, so for example, if you've got a, a factory and, and you want to automate it, we can provide a, a, a 5G network in that specific location. And that's definitely something on our, on our roadmap for, for development as 5G rolls out. So it's not just a question of, um, you know, 5G, 5G being complete job done and then it, and it's there. I think what you're going to see is a continual evolution, a continual overlay, and actually a continual dialogue with our customers about where they need the 5G that we will look to sort of cater to as well. Yeah, fantastic. And it ties in nicely to our next question, actually. So uh, Pedvac from New South Wales has asked, remote working and regional remote living and working is now more common. Will 5G in its millimeter uh, wavelength really be practical in lower population regional areas? Yes, I mean, there's, there's two parts of that question, right, which is around remote working and, and, and you know, remote uh, learning and, and remote medicine and all these sort of remote 
experiences that we're all uh, a lot more familiar with over the you know, over the last sort of uh, 12 to 18 months. And you know, 5G absolutely plays a role in in providing connectivity and, and enabling that sort of remote experience. And in fact, you know what we saw with our 5G home product, which is a, a broadband replacement product, is that you know the the um, pandemic and the lockdown that that resulted um, ended up you know driving a huge surge in demand for um, for that product because you know ultimately customers are after you know high um, speed, high reliable, uh, highly reliable uh, connectivity to, to the home because of, of the need to stay um, homebound through 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 lockdown. But I think the the second part of that question was was around um, you know regional, and I think it's an interesting point. Um, you know, I think where where the um, uh, the question was going was you know for for something like millimeter wave which has um, uh, great speed but but limited coverage, will you see it everywhere? And the answer is no. But what you will see is that that particular spectrum and the particular application deployed where it makes most sense and you know, in the case of providing connectivity to customers uh, obviously the, the plan is to, to sort of um, deploy that where it makes most sense interestingly enough you know with the, the mid-band spectrum that we've got so if you've got millimeter wave at the top and low band uh, at the bottom you've got this thing called mid-band spectrum in the middle um, you know we already see today um, you know connectivity speeds in the hundreds of, of megabits per second possible over that mid-band spectrum. And that has much greater proposition, uh, propagation characteristics versus um, millimeter wave. And so for a, a typical home user, be that in, in metro or regional, something like a, a mid-band based solution um, would, would, be, um, would be suitable. That's great. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, the next question comes from Rasa Singham in Queensland. Will Wi-Fi 6 and 5G coexist or complement each other in indoor and outdoor environments? Not yeah, so you have I, can have a, I can have a crack at <laughs> that one. So, so, uh, uh, so Wi-Fi 6 is, is the latest, um, uh, latest iteration of, of Wi-Fi technology, which I'm sure everyone is, is quite sort of familiar with. Uh, and in many ways, it promises um, uh, similar benefits to, to to 5G in that it's it's designed for high speed, high capacity, uh, low latency. I think um, in terms of the question, yes, they are complementary technologies and, and and will coexist just like uh, 4G and Wi-Fi coexist today. Slightly different applications, slightly different suitability. The one thing I would say, however, is that Wi-Fi itself uses uh, unlicensed spectrum, so it uses uh, spectrum bands that are, that are available to um, anyone basically to, to 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 use, and as I'm sure folks are aware, um, you know if you're uh, you know, at work or at home and, and and you and you look at the various sort of Wi-Fi access points available, there's normally quite a few and, and many which you don't sort of recognise because to be honest, no one's controlling or, or, or regulating that. So one of the challenges you find with Wi-Fi is that um, it can become congested and actually. Um, managing the, the end user experience uh, can be a, a bit more challenging. Um, therefore, 5G, which is uh, based on license spectrum, it's spectrum that a, an operator has um, uh, purchased the license for from, from the government and therefore has sole use of that spectrum, um, the operator is able to control the experience a lot, a lot more. So I think what you'll start to see, and I, I talked about sort of um, private networks, but um, you know, what you'll start to see is 5G used a lot more in terms of providing that um, that sort of uh, last mile type connectivity for, for applications that have traditionally been Wi-Fi based, even though Wi-Fi itself, with the advent of Wi-Fi 6, is going to improve in terms of capability. So I hope, hope that makes sense. Wow, fantastic. Thank you. That's great. Um, John, I'm going to throw to you. We've got lots of questions coming through at the moment. Um, this question's from Cameron, and he would like uh, you to discuss the management of risk associated with connection latency, throughput, and availability for safety-critical applications. Can you uh, expand on that for us? 
Yeah, thanks, Belinda. Um, yeah, great question. And uh, going back to that edge to cloud model that I spoke about earlier, um, firstly, we, we need to start with the the end use case that that we're looking at. Now, if I took took one, um, picked one at random, for example, uh, autonomous driving. Right. Obviously, this is a situation where they can't afford to be a a significant lag time between something happening in the real world and an analytics um, engine, for example, detecting something or someone on the road, et cetera. So this is this whole idea of getting the data processing and the analytics as close to the to that um, to that endpoint as possible. Uh, in some cases, it, it may need to be in the vehicle in order to have that processing done you know, as quickly as it needs to be done. In other cases, um, it may make sense that it can be done within the 5G network um, uh, because you know the, the, there is the possibility for it to be a couple of milliseconds uh, lag or if the lag time can be a little more than that for example you know an adjustment to a driving direction or uh, something that's not absolutely time critical maybe that it makes sense to do that uh, back on the cloud itself uh, which would you know introduce you know typically you know double digit millisecond um, uh, latency or, or lag so you really need to work backwards from from what um, what's actually needed um, and depending on that you know that'll influence the design now what that edge to cloud model that I described earlier shows is from an AWS perspective we try to support customers with all of the above right depending on what it is they're trying to do um, we can either provide those services back on the cloud or um, push the AWS component of that solution as close to that to that end user as as possible. So um, hopefully that that um, goes some way towards answering that question, Belinda. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. And Harvey, I've got a, a few here for you. I'm going to kick off with the first one. Is ultra low latency expected to be available for consumers or is it just going to be for business services? No, both. Um, you know, what, what we are um, uh, doing at the moment is is uh, rolling out 5G in, in a couple of forms. And again, maybe just to sort of um, talk about some of the different underlying underlying technologies. The 5G that is present in the market at the moment is, uh, is called um, non-standalone. So it actually um, leverages uh, the 4G layer uh, for... Um, things like signaling and 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 the like, um, and then five G for 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 the connectivity. But one of the um, uh, challenges with with this uh, type of of um, deployment, which has been done in, in most countries around the world, um, is that it doesn't provide the super low latency connectivity um, experience from 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 the get go. It improves latency versus uh, say four G, so you get that latency improvement. But it's not the ultra low latency that you know um, we are, we are uh, targeting. But what you're going to see over uh, the next um, sort of few few months is around the deployment of of standalone architecture. So this is the if you like the pure five uh, G network, um, which is five um, G uh, in the radio, five G in, in, in the core, and provides that uh, ultra low latency capabilities. Uh, that will unlock some of those use cases. Now, those will be that that technology, that network will be available to to both um, uh, consumer and enterprise customers. And we've got some some you know r really interesting plans about how we're going to uh, leverage that for both our consumer and enterprise customers. That's great. We actually had a few questions around that, so you've been able to cover off uh, a good update there. Um, the next question, Harvey, for you comes from Daniel, and it's a question around coverage. Will the coverage of 5G be significantly improved versus 4G? It, it, it kind of comes back to the to the point I was making before around um, spectrum. So whether it's 3G, 4G, 5G, ultimately the wireless networks are built on on spectrum layers, and um, you know, operators around the world and here in Australia have access to certain spectrum bands and they can leverage that to provide different types of uh, coverage, be that 3G, 4G or, or, or 5G. So I think the, the simple answer is that 5G itself won't per se 
provide greater coverage um, from a from a technology perspective, but it will it will definitely enhance the experience where where you do have coverage because you know, from an operator perspective, what we are doing um, is is sort of switching out the various sort of spectrum layers over over time. So utilizing the spectrum that has been traditionally three G or four G and effectively um, replacing it with 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 five G. Um, so the, the the physics, if you like, the the, the uh, amount of coverage that you get uh, on, on a given um, uh, you know mobile tower is not necessarily going to change because the the spectrum basically defines that in, in many ways. Um, but the the performance of of that spectrum is going to improve, um, and you know some of the enhancements around five G and, and including the ability to dynamically share that spectrum and to aggregate that spectrum will actually really enhance the, the experience that, that customers are going to get. So I don't think we should think about 5G as providing this massive step change in, in overall coverage. It's more around the performance of the network where you've got it um, and, and delivering those extra um, use cases using those enhanced capabilities. Okay, fantastic. John, I'm going to throw to you with a question here. Uh, the question's from Michael, and he uh, asks, are there any thoughts on when AWS Wavelength will come to Australia? Great. Um, so for those who are not aware of AWS Wavelength, it's a relatively new service. Uh, the Amazon Web Services launched just over a year ago. Uh, and what AWS Wavelength is, um, is a set of AWS infrastructure and software we actually deploy into the mobile, uh, the 5G mobile network to do exactly what we've been talking about here, um, getting that computational um, capability and storage data storage capability out into, into the network closer to that end user. So at the moment, AWS Wavelength is only available in the United States, uh, Japan and South Korea. Um, we are um, obviously considering other countries. So we don't have any any date at the moment where we're planning on launching it in Australia, but um, but certainly, uh, you know, we're certainly looking to expand AWS Wavelength beyond, um, beyond those three countries. All right, fantastic. Um, I've got a question here um, that both of you might be interested in answering. Uh, the question is from Ganesh and he asks, are all the use cases mentioned so far require QOS? What is the status of Quas in five G? Yeah, I mean, maybe I, I can sort of um, uh, kick off and, and just talk a little bit about five um, G and and and, and Quas. So, um, one of the benefits of five um, G, and in fact, the standalone version of of five G that I was talking about before, is that um, it allows us to define certain uh, layers or or slices of networks. So network slicing is, is a term that, that folks may have, have heard. And a network slice basically allows us to configure a network in a, in a particular way um, to cater to this, the specific needs of, of an application. So for example, if you've got something that requires um, uh, low battery power, for example, but, but high coverage. So an example of that would be um, a sensor. So if you've got Lots of, of sensors and a, a, on a farm, for example, they don't need much connectivity, but there's lots of them and they need to have their batteries last a long time. Then actually you can define and configure a, uh, a network slice that is catered to that specific need. And therefore, if you're the, the farmer in that case, you can actually um, um, uh, get access to or purchase, if you like, that, that, that slice of, of the network. And at the same time, if you want, uh, for example, a slice that's geared around um, gaming or video that requires um, high upload and download in the case of, of gaming, say, uh, and low latency, well, then you can have a separate slice that sits on top of that. So there's some really interesting um, opportunities that, that open up as a result of 5G and um, orchestration that, that sort of exists within the network to deliver these, these slices. So um, you're gonna hear more about that, that concept of, of, of slicing um, as um, standalone networks are, are, are rolled out in, in the, over the next um, sort of coming months. Um, and 
you know, we're looking forward to working with partners to identify what those particular use cases are. Um, because in, in many ways, it, it really changes the model for, for us as an operator. You're not sort of selling a, a one size fits all network. You're, you're coming up with what is a, um, a highly tailored um, uh, you know, version of that network, a highly customized version of that network for, for individual use cases that, that can cater to different customer needs. Yeah, I think from, from my perspective, the, the key thing there is in, in years gone by, you were either connected to the network or, or you weren't. And as Harvey just explained, I think we're moving into a world where the, the options for customers in terms of the way they connect um, is, is expanding. And even within 5G, you know, many options, even within that 5G um, technology. Um, and so when we think about quality of service, the temptation is we use kind of the average of averages rather than think about the specific use case or use cases and understand, you know, what, what does a high quality of service mean for, to use Harvey's example, collecting a very small data packet from a farm sensor every 30 minutes versus needing to stream, you know, uh, ultra high definition video in real time, you know, um, you know, between between sites or something like that. So um, quality of service is, um, is something that we need to be thinking carefully about from a use case perspective and then using the options that are now available to us versus just, you know, you're connected or you're not connected, um, as we were many years ago, uh, to to build not only solutions that meet the meet the requirement, but are also cost effective for the you know for the use case as well, and the economics of that uh, all works. So um, yeah, lots of choice for um, for uh, for people going forward. That's great. Thank you both for the answers to that question. Uh, Harvey, one for you, and this is actually one that I'm very interested in knowing more about too. How is automated driving going to be enhanced with 5G technology? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about um, autonomous cars and, and uh, vehicles as, as, as a sort of a, a typical use case. And it's maybe worthwhile just sort of unpacking a little bit what, how, how 5G um, intersects with that. So. Um, again, just to sort of reiterate, you know, 5G provides us with this um, high capacity, high bandwidth, um, high speed and low latency connectivity. And, and by the way, when I say latency, just for those that aren't aware, um, you know, latency is, is effectively the, the time it takes for a signal to sort of do a round trip. So, so um, if, if you've got a lot of um, lag, so if it takes a lot of time for, for, the, for the data to, to go back, up and back, as it were, then uh, it is problematic for things that require um, high degrees of responsiveness. So, so if you're um, uh, in the case of the autonomous uh, car, if you're trying to um, drive a car remotely uh, through some form of um, you know, remote driver, having um, you know, a, a, a half a second delay is, is, is going to end in tears because all of a sudden you, you, you don't have the reaction that you need in order to control that car um, um, safely. So um, the, the advent of, of um, that sort of low latency connectivity coupled with, as John has sort of explained, this, this um, uh, huge opportunity we have around edge cloud and cloud compute um, allows us to then do some clever things as it relates to, to, to those vehicles. Now, the, the, the sort of two you know, broad use cases, one is around um, the sort of the management and control and, and, and uh, tracking of, of the vehicle itself. So again, if you're wanting to do um, clever things in terms of um, collision prevention, for example, and, and you need to be able to uh, um, understand what information that is being captured by the cameras and, and to predict particular scenarios, particularly the, the um, unusual sort of edge case scenarios, you need a lot of compute power. And you can either do that on board in, in the car itself, or you can do that in, in the cloud. And when you've got 5G connectivity, it allows you to do that in, in, in the cloud. So again, it sort of takes the pressure off that end device in the case, uh, in this case, the, 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 the vehicle and, and, and do that sort of processing uh, in, in, in the cloud. The other 
um, use case that you know we've we, we've we've seen around um, autonomous vehicles and, and and driverless cars is actually uh, the other way around. It's, it's actually putting um, content and and streaming into the into the car. So you know if you relieve the driver of of of, of needing to um, uh, drive the car, then the question is, well, you know, what, what are they going to do? They're, they've got a lot of time on their hands and, and you know, in-car uh, entertainment and, and in-car in interactivity becomes uh, a lot more relevant. So again, if you're looking to um, stream uh, large um, volumes of, 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 of video, for example, on the go, then something like 5G is going to um, un unlock that as well. I would say that you know the whole topic of of, of autonomous vehicles has got a lot of um, evolving to do. I think there's the, you know in addition to the technology, there's a whole bunch of um, you know constraints around you know, regulation and and, and 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 driver perception and and all sorts there. But you know, for me, in, in the short term, you know you're more likely going to see some application in sort of more controlled environments. So if you're thinking about um, you know, airports, for example, or, um, or or factories or retirement homes or whatever it is, wherever you've got a sort of a precinct that is a lot more of a controlled environment, I think you're going to see um, autonomous vehicles really um, uh, pop up there first before you see it sort of mass market uh, on, on, on the streets of, uh, of Australia. The small trial areas first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Very good. Great. Uh, John, a question for you from Sean. For many small, uh, sorry, let me start again. For small but many IoT applications, the price of 4G chipsets limited market penetration. Are the pricing for 5G chipsets in a better place for the small but many IoT applications? Uh, thanks, Sean, for your question. Um, so a couple of aspects here. Firstly, I think it kind of goes back to what we were uh, talking about a few minutes ago. The risk is that we, we, think, um, we think one size fits all in terms of um, the type of connection that's needed. So <clears throat> you know, there are, you know, Harvey explained earlier around the network slicing, but also the different technologies that are already there, whether it's 3G, 4G, 5G, uh, the the narrow band technologies. So you've really got to start with that use case and not all use cases um, not all use cases are going to need um, high bandwidth 5g connections. So that's um, that's the right place to start. Um, the second thing I would say is you know 5g uh, chipsets and, and technology I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll make a prediction and say they'll follow a similar, uh, performance kind of cost curve that many other technologies um, have had and that and that is that they become more affordable over time but I think the risk is that people I think well 5g is available so everything needs to be 5g and um, and I think you know Harvey talked about um, the farming example earlier I think you know th there will be applications where um, it, it's just it's just either it's not needed in terms of the amount of data we're talking about moving around or um, the economics of it just don't work for for what's um, what's being looked at. So um, hopefully that answers Sean's question. Thanks, John. That's great. Harvey, uh, a question here from um, actually I don't have who this question's from, but uh, how is five G different from wireless MBN? Can you share some details on that for us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, so, so, what we're, we're we're talking about with a sort of wireless NBN or or five G um, uh, wirelines, sorry, fixed wireless solutions is, is a category of products called um, fixed wireless access. So, um, fixed wireless access has been around for a wee while. In fact, you know, uh, at Optus, you know, we've been selling four G based um, um, wireless broadband for for many years. Um, the challenge you face is that the experience that you can deliver on a on a, on a 4G network is um, uh, constrained by, by by that technology. So, um, in the case of of um, NBN, they like us have have used a, a 4G based um, uh, technology to provide wireless connectivity. Um, 5G allows that to be enhanced, and what we've seen in the case of the 
Optus experience is, um, you know, whereas previously on 4G, you know, you'd be getting, uh, you know, speeds of, of you know, 10, 20, 30 megabits per second. When you do that same experience on, on, on 5G, you get much faster speeds and you're talking about hundreds of megabits per second. And, and, and the reason for that is um, 5G unlocks different spectrum bands. So going back to the, to the point I was making previously around spectrum, um, in Australia, you know, we've got access to what's called the 3500 megahertz spectrum, and, and that is a, um, a mid-band spectrum band that provides um, you know, decent connectivity, uh, capacity and decent, decent coverage. And, and what we've rolled out to date with our uh, 5G home product has been based on that um, 3500 megahertz spectrum. And because the spectrum is essentially empty, it hasn't been used for 4G uh, to date. Um, and because it's um, a wide spectrum band, like I say, you can you can start to deliver um, some um, speeds that I think from a, an average home user are, m are much more um, fit for purpose. So for example, as we all know now, you know working from home, uh, the expectation is that you, you need a 50 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second uh, connection minimum, particularly if you've got multiple end users in, 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 in the household. What's interesting is that the fixed wireless access um, evolution will continue because millimeter wave then provides another um, uh, technology that we can deploy for that particular use case. And so whereas today on using mid-band spectrum, you've got fixed wireless access providing you know, hundreds of megabits per second, with millimeter wave, you can do gigabit connectivity. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the experience takes another um, step up in terms of, of, of performance. So the exciting thing about uh, 5G is that, you know, you will continue to see this sort of evolution and whether it's mobile connectivity or, or, or fixed connectivity, you, you're bound to see um, improved performance over time from this technology. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, a question from Alan and Harvey, I think this one might be for you. Given the higher frequencies used in 5G, will there be a need for more base stations to main, maintain coverage? Uh, so again, the, the, it's a good question. And I think you know, it, it relates again to the, to the use of different spectrum bands. And the way I've heard it described, if you like, is a, um, is a layer cake. You, you've got low band spectrum, which forms the, the, the sort of the bottom layer of the cake. It, 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 it's wide, but maybe a bit thin in terms of, you know, you've got that coverage, but you haven't got the, the capacity or the speed. On top of that, you've then got the, the mid band spectrum that provides um, improvements in terms of capacity and speed, but the coverage is not as big as, as, as the low band. And then at the top of the, the wedding cake, if you like, you've got this millimeter wave, which provides you know, super fast speeds and, and great capacity, but has very limited coverage. Now, as an operator, you're looking to deploy all of those in a combination that, that makes sense. Uh, where you need coverage, but not much uh, capacity, you can use low band. Uh, where you want super high capacity, super high speed, um, but not much coverage, you can use millimeter wave and then mid band somewhere in between. So the question around sort of the, the number of towers kind of relates basically to how and where the, the technology will be deployed. So in the case of millimeter wave, if you put millimeter wave on every mobile tower across Australia, you wouldn't have end-to-end -end coverage from, from, from any operator. Again, it's just the, the sort of the physics of, of, of the spectrum means that it can only go so far. So if you want to um, provide that, that what's called densification or, or, or fill in the gaps uh, with that millimeter wave coverage, you're then going to have to look to deploy additional sites in, in additional um, areas. Now, from an operator perspective, what that means is that we have to work out where millimeter wave is most applicable. Um, and, and, and that can include working with um, you know, our partners to say you know, where it's most required uh, and then looking to sort of deploy that. And the natural places that you're going to start are, are the areas that have the highest usage, because remember, millimeter wave has that uh, high capacity. Um, it's, a, it's a very fat pipe, if you like, so you can fit a lot of users over that, 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 that connection. Um, where you've got the, the need for uh, you know, 
super low latency. So again, imagine a, um, a stadium full of, of um, spectators. You, you'd want to you know, connect them all at the same time. Well, again, millimeter wave, great, great opportunity to, to create that, um, that um, capacity and, and, and speed for those sort of multiple users. Um, so it, it's going to be a little bit of a, um, a mixture. I, I, it goes back to the point I was making before, to think of 5G as being a single, you know, um, uh, sort of homogenous um, uh, layer of, of, of networks, probably not correct. You, you, you're going to see deployments tailored to the specific needs of different customers and, and, and different use cases, which in some instances will mean a, a additional towers and additional points for customers to connect. Okay, great. And Harvey, just as a follow on um, and a question about around 3G and 3G technology, how long do we expect 3G to remain in operation? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, the the, um, uh, the spectrum that, that we have is, is a finite resource. It's, it's like real estate. You've only got so much that you can, can use and, and any operator around the world is constantly reviewing you know how they use that spectrum to to um, serve the, the needs of their, their customers um, uh, in an optimum way. So, three G is, is uh, you know a legacy technology, and in fact, um, as an industry, we're now sort of moving away from of three G and reusing or, or what we term as refarming the, the the spectrum that has been traditionally used for three G and 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 um, freeing that up for for use on. Uh, technologies like 5G. So that whole refarming uh, exercise is a process that the whole industry is going through at the moment uh, in terms of um, uh, gradually um, uh, refarming and, and, and refreshing that technology so that it's more uh, future-proof and, and fit for purpose uh, for, for our customers going forwards. Fantastic. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, here from David, are there many consumer devices on the market that support millimeter wave, or are they just industrial type devices? Yeah, so actually, the um, uh, in terms of consumer handsets, so so if you think about devices in terms of phones, basically, uh, there currently aren't any. Uh, uh, devices uh, in the market, but that's about to change pretty soon. So uh, over the next sort of few months, we'll, we'll see some uh, important announcements around uh, millimeter wave um, capable devices and you know, Australian consumers will be able to connect their phones to the millimeter wave network um, pretty soon. Um, however, having said that, um, there are already commercial devices available for fixed wireless access, for example. So um, you know, using the millimeter wave band. So like any technology, I think what you're going to see is um, uh, to begin with a, a sort of a limited set of, of first generation devices. That, and then over time, you know, more devices becoming available. I think as John was saying, you know, like any technology cycle, the, the, uh, the, the earlier versions of the technology tend to be a little bit more expensive. But, you know, as, as um, Things scale up as, as uh, you know, economies of, of scale kick in, then you see the, the costs come down and, and, and the number of devices increase. So, you know, my, my I guess is that over the, over the next sort of 12 months, you're going to see a number of, of different uh, millimeter wave capable handsets um, hit the market here in Australia and, and customers will be able to you know, experience the, the super high speeds that millimeter wave provides uh, for themselves. Okay, great. Um, there's been lots of great information in today's session. And there's a question from Rajesh. He would just like if you could elaborate a little bit more on ultra low latency and exactly what it means. And I think it might be a good opportunity just to refresh uh, everyone on that particular topic. So um, Harvey, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so, so I mean, la latency, um, so, so latency in, in, in networking terms is, is, like I say, the sort of the, the time it takes for um, data to, to sort of transit a network. So, um, uh, if you if you're communicating with a with a server in the network, the time it takes for the information packets to go from the uh, end user to the to the um, server and back that's that sort of round trip is 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 what we sort of normally uh, refer to when we're talking about sort of latency, and that that is normally 
uh, measured in, in, in milliseconds. And the, the, the higher the latency, the, the more problematic it is for any application that requires that, that um, uh, interaction or, or, or constant communication to take place. It's not such a problem when you're just providing information one way or data one way. So um, for something like streaming, for example, not, not so much of an issue, but for something like online gaming, uh, it is a big issue. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, autonomous cars, if you're trying to control a car or a drone or a vehicle that requires that real-time uh, connection, then, then latency, uh, high latency can be a, a real problem. So um, what we are looking at when we look at sort of ultra-low latency um, and ultra-reliable <laughs> connectivity is part of the, the, the standards around 5G is to, is to take that um, latency uh, and reduce it to, um, it, it's not real time, we never, never quite get to real time, but you know, a single digit millisecond uh, connectivity. And you know, that, that is um, uh, you know, a, a step change in terms of where we are uh, today, where you know, conic, uh, latency is, is, is you know, measured in terms of you know, 20 or 30 milliseconds or, or whatever it is in terms of, uh, of, of the type of experience that you've got today. So when you, you know, reduce it and provide that sort of end-to-end -end, uh, quality, uh, all of a sudden um, the ability to provide what are termed sort of mission-critical type applications open up. So where you need that, that, that um, control, where you need that, that um, you know, real-time connection and it has to be always connected, that's, that's what, we, what we're sort of talking about when we're talking about um, ultra-reliable low-latency connectivity. Just Thank um, you very much just, for that. just add a little to that, Linda. Um, so Harvey's covered off network latency. And then the other thing to be aware of um, is any latency that might be added in what's called application latency. So you get the data to a server, for example. Um, how long does it take the application to actually process that data and you know, use the example of recognizing something in an image? Um, how long does it take for the application to, to do that recognition and then work out you know, what uh, information it needs to send back and get that done as well? So that's why it's not, it's, it's, it's the, um, the network itself, but then also in some cases, the need to push that, the, the data processing and the computation closer to that end user as well as we've been talking about in this session to reduce that application latency um, if, if, there is, um, if that need exists. Yeah, it's a really good point, and, and and I think I, I think to to sort of build on that, you, you, what what we we're dealing with is is a sort of combination of of technologies that we're always looking to optimize. Some of it to do with uh, the, the the type of of networking technology, some to do with the application, some to do with just distance, you know. And then that that you know when we're talking about sort of edge, um, you know, much of that is to do with actual proximity. So the, the the longer the distance that you need to communicate over, the 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 again the the challenges of the physics, uh, you know, increases the amount of latency in that. So, so when we're looking at some of these use cases and some of these applications, you've got to look at at the whole end-to-end -end experience uh, and an end-to-end -end solution for the customer, and look to optimize um, across it. So, it's it's not just a question of uh, necessarily five G being the answer, but five G in, in conjunction with the, with the, the whole end-to-end uh, -end, um, uh, solution that will ultimately deliver the benefits that customers are looking for. I think it's a great point from John. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, both of you. Um, there's been lots of great information in today's session and we have a few minutes left. So John, I might just ask you, uh, do you have any closing comments, remarks that you'd like to share with the wider audience? Um, the, the one thing that we haven't talked about today, um, which I'll just give a, a little bit of, again, pique some curiosity around is, is voice enablement. You know, I think um, one of the things that, and you know, thinking of the, the audience here from Engineers Australia, um, the opportunity for voice is, is still largely untapped. When I say voice, voice recognition and voice control, and that's something that 5G will also, you know, it's, it's a bandwidth um, uh, constrained problem to some degree at the moment as well. Um, so just you know, we haven't talked about it today. It's just something that uh, um, that 
it isn't often thought about in terms of industrial or commercial applications. We tend to think of, you know, the uh, assistant, whether it's, uh, you know, Siri or Alexa or other uh, types of assistants. But these types of voice recognition technologies are also being deployed in enterprise um, applications now. So that's also something to, um, you know, a really powerful set of use cases that, that um, you should think about going forward. Thanks, John. Lots of great use cases to consider. And Harvey, any thoughts from you as we wrap up today? Yeah, look, I mean, hopefully um, everyone has, has um, you know, learned something about 5, 5G today. But the thing I would I'd highlight is that, you know, this, like any technology, is, is set to evolve. And, um, you know, I mentioned in, in my presentation around the need to innovate and, and continue to uh, look at different use cases and, and different applications. And the reality is, is that, you know, we're going to need to do that in conjunction with businesses, with enterprise, with, with key partners and, and, and technology providers. So, you know, if, if today's been of, of interest in terms of the, the subject, um, and you can see the potential application within your particular industry or, or, or business, I'd really encourage folks to sort of reach out because I think, um, you know, Part of, of, of what's going to determine success over the, over the coming years is collaboration uh, between uh, companies like Optus and AWS, as well as uh, individual businesses and, and, and industry groups. So I think this is a, an exciting area um, and one that's going to provide, I think, a great foundation for a lot of um, innovation and value creation across the industry. But it's one that we're going to need to do together. And I, I think that the audience that we've got here today Obviously, from an engineering perspective, I suspect that a lot of folks are going to be the, the sort of the advocates and, and, and those folks that are evangelizing the benefits of technologies like 5G within their organization. So I'd encourage them to sort of um, reach out and, and, and work with us to find some of these future solutions. Thanks, Harvey. Um, that's all the time we have for today. So thank you again, Harvey and John, for your time and your insights shared at today's session. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia and their industry partner Optus for making our webinar possible. We'd appreciate your feedback on the program today to help us improve and plan for future sessions. So please complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you at the next webinar.